Joining us now is Oji Ope with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinx. Good morning. <laughs> really? <laughs> Tundu, we're in trouble. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. TGIF. Yes, yes. Tundu, so we're too. matching today. You look yes. victorious. Yes. I love that little Thank detail you. there. Thank good morning. You. Good morning, morning Rafai. Hi, good morning, Oji. How are you? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Well, good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United Kingdom, the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, keeps her promise. On Thursday, the Duchess met with Mila Sneddon, a five-year-old cancer patient who featured in her Hold Still photography project, kissing her father through a window during the lockdown last year. Kate Middleton wore a pink dress for Mila because she told the Duchess that pink was her favorite color. In the United States, Amy Cooper, the woman who was accused of racial profiling last May, after she called the police on a black man that was bird watching in Central Park, New York, is now suing her former employer for terminating her job inappropriately on the grounds that the incident was not thoroughly investigated. And the artwork of renowned painter Vincent van Gogh has come to life in New York City in an exhibition that provides a history of the painter, his life and his art. In Thailand, two stolen hand-carved artifacts dating back to the 9th and 10th centuries were returned to the country in a ceremony more than 50 years overdue. The 1,500 pound antiquities had been exported from the country and donated to the city of San Francisco. In Germany, the government has agreed to fund projects worth 1.1 billion euros over 30 years to atone for his role in genocide and property seizures in Namibia more than a century ago. And in France, President Emmanuel Macron has asked Rwandans to forgive France for its role in the 1994 Rwandan genocide in which about 800,000 ethnic Tutsis and moderate Hutsus died. In Nigeria, the Olu Advisory Council of the Ishekiri Kingdom in Delta State has announced August 21st as the date for the crowning of the Olu designate Prince Utiyeye Norisheshola Emiko. Under sports, Nigeria's women's national basketball team, the Tigress, is set to face Puerto Rico, Serbia and Belgium in three tune-up friendlies ahead of the Olympic Games. Finally, under entertainment, the 94th Academy Awards have been postponed for a second consecutive year as COVID-19 pandemic rules extend. The ceremony is now scheduled to take place at the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles, California on March 27, 2022. Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria. Yisam Wike, the governor of River State on Thursday, threatened to flog the hell out of former governor of Niger State, Babangida Aliyu, for calling him a dictator. In this video that has now gone viral, Wike, during a press conference, warned the former governor that River State was not a state that people move around, claiming that they are fighting the People's Democratic Party. Let's take a quick look. Remember in 2014, 2015, the same Ali Babangida was one of those who, with other governors, were going around to bring down PDP. And of course he was happy he did that. Today, look at the consequences. That is such a man that had the temerity, the audacity, to talk to a governor who still produced provide, produce the highest votes in 2015. In 2015, what happened to him? He insisted that his own boy would be governor. In 2019, he insisted, and PDP lost. Who is the dictator then? Who is the dictator? Up to now, even why the state congress cannot take place? Because he wants to dictate who will be the chairman of the party. Ali thinks that it was that time they were moving around, say they are fighting the PDP. We have flogged the hell out of him. He like, should know. The university is not where he thinks. We have flogged the hell out of him here. I mean, I don't understand what that means. Is it physically flogging the governor? I mean, I'm just trying to imagine how he's going to do that. But I mean, he also accused the former governor of dictatorship as well in this video. So yeah. I mean, I think that they should find a way to tone down their rhetoric, really. Well, I don't speak <laughs> macho grandstanding <laughs> as a language. It's not one that I'm familiar with, so I have no idea what this means. Does it mean like a figurative flogging at the polls or something? Or like literally 
take a king to him or a whip. <laughs> and then they do it when I'm baffled. <laughs> I've been laughing anyway, since I watched I, the I video. I think, again, uh, you know, this is about language in politics. One of the sensitive things about uh, politics is the kind of language that you deploy. And you can use the kind of language that can cause division, that can cause disaffection. And that is why, you know, we often appeal uh, to politicians to tone down their rhetoric. Yes. Uh, because the kind of rhetoric uh, you deploy can, you know, even derail the objectives of good relations and internal democracy within the party. That's the first point. Now, uh, Governor Wiki and uh, former Governor uh, Ali Babangida, Dr. Ali Babangida, the Tabamina, the uh, servant uh, uh, governor of uh, Niger State for two times. Uh, you know, they should uh, just take it easy. What has triggered this is uh, Dr. Ali Babangida referring to Governor Wiki as a dictator within the People's Democratic Party. So there is a dimension about the politics within the party mm -hmm. in this regard. And, uh, Governor Ali Babangida, as he then was, uh, having a recent interview on television and saying that he and other Northern leaders worked against the interests of then uh, President uh, Goodluck Jonathan, who was seeking a, a second term uh, in office. But I think that, you know, the insults are unnecessary. There was a part of it that I saw you cut out <laughs> when he said at PDP meetings, uh, <laughs> former Governor Ali Babangida will go and sit in front oh. and he will bulge his eyes out. <laughs> you know, that was what he said. And that uh, if he thought that this was that, the time when they were in government, if he tried it in the river state, he would flog the hell out of him. Uh, I mean, again, if you look at it, uh, I know there is no seniority in uh, among uh, past governors or present yeah. governors. But uh, Dr. Babangida Ali was governor uh, before Wiki. Even if you look at it culturally, he's also an older person. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, both of them and all politicians should just tone down uh, their rhetoric. Really? The way uh, Governor Wiki was sounding, it's like if uh, uh, Dr. Ali Babangida had been yeah, anywhere they, near him, he could have given him a slap. Yes. A dirty one <laughs> at that. We don't want that kind of culture of politics Correct. and it's not a good example that those who are in positions of leadership are using the language of the street uh, in engaging themselves this is not about how to build a party this is not about how to build nigeria right. this is just about ego right rufai what do you think governor Wike meant by uh flogging the former governor babangida liu empty threats if he sees governor babangida liu can he literally flog him no <laughs> He's just saying that because he's upset, but political office holders should have more decorum in the way they speak. But I'd like to give Dr. Uh, Governor Wiki an assignment. How about he flogs poverty out of River State and unemployment? I mean, those are better things to flog. I'll be excited if he talks about that. And that's the problem I have with our politicians. They never talk about the main issue. It's always about them. Anyway, small minds talk about people. So it's always about their other political enemies they talk about. Great minds talk about ideas. How about the governor talk very passionately about how he can stop the massive unemployment rate in River State? That is going to about 47%. A lot of people don't have jobs that have led to the massive insurgency. How about talking about flogging away the environmental challenge in River State? In Port Harcourt, there's a big problem with soot. People don't breathe in good air. There's a study that says the lungs of an average person that stays in Port Harcourt for the next 20 years will be severely affected. Those are the issues. How about being very passionate about those issues and addressing those issues? How about flogging out crime in River State, which Port Harcourt happens to be a heartland in terms of kidnapping in Nigeria today right. and other forms of crime? So those are better things to flog. I'd rather the governor flogs all of those very nefarious acts out of his state rather than flog uh, Governor Aliyah. He's not going to do any such thing. I'm, I'm sure he's going to call the governor my brother the next day. You see, don't die in this politician's war. When they you fight their war, that, Rufa, don't yeah. die in their war. They're just, they're, they're you playing, they're acting. That. It's all Nollywood script. <laughs> well, when all you right. say I will beat this person, you will beat that person. You don't know how fit the other person exactly. is. Exactly. I know people who... Said, I will beat you, I will I'm beat sorry, you. I've been they ended up the being, uh, having the broken bones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. We'll take another story. Following the appointment of the new Chief of Army Staff, Major General Farouk Yahaya, a video of soldiers jubilating with their commander has now gone viral. Let's take a look. It has been registered. The course is standing right before you. <laughs> Oh, 
week. There's going to be a special moment that will be organized. Yes, sir. That will have this special celebration for the gift of God. Again, on behalf of the course, I wish to encourage each and individual of us to go back. You yourself, your family, your people back home to submit the new course in the hands of God. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. The grace of God, teacher, and I will bring this one to an end. We will go back to our normal places. Our commitment and dedication, we can do it. So thank you so very much for everything. You know, Tindra, I particularly enjoyed watching this video because it does appear that the soldier's morale was high. You know, it was very uh, impressive to see that for me. And then I particularly liked the fact that, you know, the army chief, Farouk Yahya, did, you know, offer uh, the prayer session. I, I really enjoyed that. I am really um, excited for him and congratulations to him. Yes, congratulations to him. I hope those who are criticizing his emergence will take some comfort in the yes. fact that the rank and file seem to be pleased with it. it, seems to be a popular choice. But I must say, we were discussing this earlier, well, briefly, during the newspaper review, weren't we? And I want to just stress the fact that we have to be sensitive in this country, especially with the kind of tensions that we're witnessing Correct. in Nigeria and the constant accusations of nepotism that continue to fall on deaf ears, for me, is worrying. Any federal government should be responsive. You have to hold yourselves accountable to the people who elected you. No government, as far as, far as I'm concerned, really has the right to be so dismissive. People want a sense of inclusion. That is not too much to ask for in a country like Nigeria. It's not petty. I mean, I think that a lot of the time people try and pretend that, oh, it's all good, it doesn't matter, and, you know, these are petty considerations. They are, in fact, not petty at all. And this is the danger of precedent. President Buhari has created a precedent of violating Section 8 of the Public Service Rules, which states that if you have served 35 years of pensionable service, you must be retired or you attain the age of 60. He extended the terms of the last service chiefs then. So why can he not do that now to show representation? It's important. I feel like try, being dismissive of the call of the, the generality of Nigerians is a really poor choice. Tindu, you're not alone in that thought. A lot of people were saying that, especially when he emerged from well, that part of the country. The argument about nepotism right. would never disappear, particularly under this administration. Because if you look at the structure of the various uh, security agencies, they are dominated by persons from a particular zone yes. of the country. And if you look at other key appointments, there is also uh, that uh, challenge. And I quoted earlier on uh, persons who had raised objection from Anise Ndibo to Nam De Kanu to Sita Chidoka to Renu Mokri to the Human Rights uh, uh, Writers Association of Nigeria. So many people have attacked this appointment on the basis of the uh, ethnic extraction of the uh, gentleman from uh, Sukutu State, uh, who is now the uh, chief of army staff. The gentleman in that uh, video was calling him Kwas. I didn't know that's what they called him. Kwas. <laughs> Kwas. <laughs> he was referring to the chief yeah. of army staff. Oh, with a K as opposed to the K. Uh, yes, but the C O A S. Correct. But what we expect is that now that this appointment has been made, the government itself will take note of the objections, the concerns that have been expressed. And what people are pointing to is Section 14, Subsection 3 of the Constitution, uh, which talks about federal character in all appointments. Well, this government may not have been so faithful uh, in that regard. So the point keeps coming up as part of the uh, national question. But now that uh, 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 Major General Farouk Yahaya has been given the job, he has his job cut out for him. He has been involved as a combatant in the various theaters of war. And, you know, he comes to the assignment uh, with very strong credentials and experience. He's been with the uh, multinational joint task force. He's been commander of first Div. He's been uh, 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 commander of uh, Operation Lafayette Dole, which is now Operation uh, Hadin Kai. So he, he understands the issue. He's been first commander in charge of terrorism and counterinsurgency. 
So in terms of uh, credentials, but what remains is for him to make that difference. These same soldiers who are hailing him, who are happy out of maybe perhaps proximity or identification, uh, you didn't state where they are from, maybe they are probably his troops That's uh, under Operation Adin Kai. Right. Yeah. But whatever it is, they will expect their welfare to be addressed because there are issues. Otherwise, these same soldiers, if they are not properly motivated, tomorrow you could find them also protesting. There is a report, somebody was quoting the Council on Foreign Relations, that in terms of leading the, leaving the counter insurgency fight, that he's been able to make a lot of difference in the, within the last year that he was appointed to the position of a uh, commander of uh, Operation Harding uh, Kai. He has to sustain that. And I made the humorous point earlier on that one of his hobbies is uh, cracking jokes. Well, he's... Uh, you know, he's well informed enough to know that this is not about cracking jokes. He will not have time to crack jokes when he's, uh, you know, in that position. He, he should go ahead immediately and begin to crack the heads of terrorists so, so that he can, you know, achieve the objective and the mandate to make Nigeria safe. But there's nothing wrong with laughter, uh, Dr. Abbas. No, it's not going to. No, otherwise, the president will have given the job to Alibaba, you know, uh, or Sheila. Your analysis of the story. <laughs> Dr. Abati, <laughs> or give the job to us, in as comedians. <laughs> I mean, real quickly, so three issues for me. Number one will be, why is it that there's always celebration and jubilation heralding uh, the start of any tenure of the chief of army staff, but in the end, it always ends in tears? And it ends in tears that we get fed up of them and we say they should go because they are out of ideas. Why? Is it really about the chief of army staff or the structure we run? Uh, because when General Tyro of blessed memory got in, there were jubilations and celebrations. But a couple of months down the line, I think about the first or second month, there was a story about some people dissenting the military, leaving the military, complaining about welfare. And we thought his emergence was going to fix every issue about welfare. So I think we should really focus on the structure. The second point for me will be about funding of the military. Our military is really underfunded. And a lot of money needs to be put into our military, especially at a point in time where we fight a war in this country. And, and I think, like Femi Falana puts it, a civil war in some parts of this country. I mean, because people are losing their means of livelihood. My third point will be this. Uh, some officers will have to be laid off because of this. And we always see this thing about hierarchical structure, that once a younger officer assumes a higher position in the military, or maybe COAS, for instance, other officers in COS 35 and 36 will be laid off because he's from COS 37. But this was not always the case. And I'll, I'll go back to 66, 1st of August, when Gowan, Yakubu Gowan got in. There was this case of disparity, because we all forget in a hurry that Yakubu Gowan was a, was a lieutenant colonel. And you had the likes of uh, Colonel Adebayo, you had the likes of Brigadier Ogudikpe, Commodore Way, that were older than Yakubu Gowan. But he needed them, and he needed their experience. So what did Yakubu Gowan do? He promoted himself to a major general, and after the war in 70, to a full-time general. So how about we look for a structure where we can still use this general, rather than just retire them from the military? Because there's a bad precedence going on in the military, and a lot of people are talking as, as regards the fact that if you're a non-Northerner in the military, you don't stand a chance. Somebody was sending me a message today and telling me that most non-Northerners, once they get to a certain position, they know they will never make coerce. So what do they do? They go back to school and they leave the military on time to be able to start private practice or another career. A lot of them have gone on to become architects and the likes. So there's that disparity in the military, and, and that's to allude to Tundu's point. But rather than just sending most of these officers away, how about looking for a role with them in the military? Because... If you are sending 27, 28 officers away, or 30 officers, or 40 officers, then you are sending them away with years of experience. And most of, most of them are major gens. Some of them have, have done so well from themselves. So the military is losing all this experience. So how about going back to the Gowan approach of 66, where Gowan still work with the likes of Ogudikpe and Wei and, um, uh, you, you, you know, Colonel Adebayo? How about that approach? I think it's something we should think of. Thank you so much. Well said, Rufai. We'll take our final story. The Barakate family show on the Human Rights Radio, hosted by Ahmad Issa, has been suspended by the National Broadcasting Commission for a clear violation of the Broadcasting Code. 
the NBC claims in a statement that it has over the years warned and fined the station over the show's repeated cases of abuse and denigrating remarks to its guests. The show's host came under fire early in the month after a video where he was seen slapping a woman who set her brother's daughter on fire went viral. Barely a week after the incident, Ahmad slapped yet another man on the show. Like it will go by the people that are present here, so we'll not put, they will not put out their names here. So you can't write their names? That is way. I mean, this is horrible, Tundu. I mean, his license has been suspended, but also the uh, suspension goes on for 30 days. And that's what a lot of people are ups- outraged about. The fact that he has been, you know, cautioned over the years and they still just give him only 30 days. It should be more. A lot of people are saying, I don't know the rules, but the fact that he may even come back and continue to do this is unacceptable. It certainly is. I mean, he is literally slap happy. Yes. What, what, what's that about? I don't get it. But yes, the NBC, I think, is correct in following their own rules. Yes. If that's what the rules say, then you have to abide, you know, by, abide by the rules unless you want to amend them. But it's not just a 30-day suspension. He's also going to pay a fine yes, to be reconnected, which I expect to be quite steep. You know, we have a bit of experience with NBC fines here. Now, don't we? <laughs> now, what the NBC, I think, are trying to establish is that whether or not you apologize, you still, and you're forgiven, you must still face the consequences of your actions. Because, you know, Ahmed Issa has apologized for slapping the woman, yes. but he must still be made to pay. This is actual criminal assault that he's perpetrating, and it cannot be allowed to continue. I, I'm in support of the NBC on this one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Bati. Well, you know, the last time we discussed this, I, one recommendation I made was that it looks like uh, Ahmed Issa, who goes uh, by the moniker uh, or the nickname, uh, ordinary president. Ordinary president, yes. You know, of the human rights radio, probably needs to go on vacation. Because, I mean, he runs what he calls human rights radio. And then he, the owner of the station, the host of the family program on the same station, now puts himself in a situation whereby he violates the fundamental rights of other persons, acting as a judge and jury in a matter in which, you know, the original objective should be to ensure justice. The uh, uh, National Broadcasting Commission, I think, is right in sanctioning him, and it's on a number of grounds. One, on professional conduct. I do not know of any code, professional code, that empowers uh, journalists to go about slapping people, particularly in the course of their work. No journalist has such a right. Two, they are accusing him under Section 1.1.21 of uh, the uh, Broadcasting Code of not respecting the social objectives of broadcasting, part of which re- includes respect for the dignity of the human person. So if you violate another person's uh, uh, dignity, then of course you are engaging in an act of violence, which is not part of the law. Now, beyond it, they said in the past, there have been several warnings, there have been several sanctions, exactly. oh, and the station yes, had paid fines yes. in the past, in the past, the NBC even went ahead to say, that, to say that they organized training and retraining, both for the staff of Human Rights Radio and also for ordinary president. And yet, in spite of that, Continuous. the Human Rights Radio violating his owner, violating the rights of persons. But another good thing that I think NBC did was that on May 26th, they gave him the right of fair hearing. He had a meeting with him, and he explained himself. He apologized. But they said after reviewing their meeting with him and the apology that he offered, they now took certain consequential actions, one of which is to withdraw the license of the station for 30 days. Now, within that period of 30 days, they hope that uh, uh, Ahmed Issa will put his house in order mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, maybe seek counseling to purge himself of whatever, you know, it is that makes him so aggressive. And that after that, under Section 15 of the code, he will now pay a uh, uh, re-connection fee, you know. uh, uh, So all of that, I think it's perfectly in order. And it should be a lesson for all persons who cannot manage their anger. I think it needs to go for an anger management uh, course, therapy, counseling. Uh, Because if we slap people who come uh, on television or on radio, because we disagree with them, there will be no, there will, I cannot there will be no media. Rufa, if it was my family member that that man slapped, I can't even, even imagine how outraged I'll be.
I mean, uh, it, it's quite shocking. He's supposed to do, you know, justice to people that society has denied justice. That's supposed to be the goal, but he's missed it. And the NBC will definitely come in hard on him because they've been warning for quite a time. So two points. The, the first point will be uh, he should examine himself properly and he should check himself because this case is bigger than this. The police also called him. There's a story running now that Peter Nkanga, the journalist that did that report, is actually threatening the life. Uh, Ham Ahmad Hisa is threatening the life of Peter Nkanga. He sent people with his number to call him up and threaten that they will kill the journalist that did the report in the first place, the BBC journalist. Secondly, I'm even more perturbed because when you look at the human rights radio and his donors, you wonder, is this the kind of person people like MacArthur Foundation are giving money for, for human rights issues? Because they gave him a grant. I think it, it's, it's about $700,000. That was most of the bulk of it he used to set up this radio. So it's not right that an NGO like MacArthur's money is being used to violate the rights of people. So I, I'd like to, to get MacArthur's comment on this, MacArthur Foundation comment on this, because they gave the bulk of the money to set this up. But the NBC needs to clamp down. And it's a lesson, most importantly, for all of us. You are never bigger than the country. You're never bigger than the law. Even if you claim you want to help people, you still need to respect people. Cheryl Sadrufai, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. That's all I have for you guys on What's well, Trending. You guys have a great much. weekend. Yes, See you next week. Thank, thank you very much.